It's Mentorship Monday. That's going to be exciting. Hope you guys are stoked and ready. Justin Linderman, how are you? Mr. Higgins, Marsha Toberman, Pat Kaufman, Peg. So the trident of truth is here. Marsha, Pat, and Peg. <laughs> we have a new trader in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Sonny Trader, a.k.a. Dennis, I think. But I'll call you. I'll go by Sonny. Sonny Trader. I like that. It's a good name. Very bright. Glad to have you here, my friend. Thank you for joining Absolute pleasure to have you. Louis Marquez, a.k.a. Dr. Wall Street. How are you? Rick, how's it going, Rick? Brad Golson, James in the house. James Ginnikin, how's it going, my man? Well, we have a jam-packed day. Today is Mentorship Monday. So if this is the first time you being here, Sunny Trader, you, you're going to love it. Because today, we're going to be covering a few things. Every Monday, uh, the first Monday of each month, we go pretty slow. And the reason we do that is for new traders or traders who just simply want a refresher. Uh, we go over what I talk about, the what, you know the focus on the trading floor, and we discuss it in a nice, slow, easy to chew detail so that that way you guys can be all caught up for the rest of the month because the rest of the month we want to go out, make some money, make some trades, and kind of go from there. So let's go ahead and just talk about really what we focus on uh, at Real Life Trading as far as day trading and or swing trading. And really the best way for us to decipher and determine what trades we're going to take is we're going to be looking for something called the gap. The gaps. Now, many, many day traders focus on gaps. I think many day traders do a great job of explaining why they looked, you know, what they do and how they make money. But what often is left out is the why. Why do gaps work? Right, so they go into how they trade them, and they go into how they make money, and they go into how they mitigate risk and things of that nature, at least sometimes. But for sure, many, many education companies, they fail to really deliver the why. Why do gaps work, and why do they don't work, and why do they do what they're going to do, and that type of thing. So that's what we're going to talk a, little bit, a lot about today, as much as possible anyway. And if you guys have any questions, this is absolutely uh, this is the day to ask. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Let Angie know. Type them in. This is a judgment-free zone. Judgment-free zone. So if you, if you have questions, you need something, you're excited about something, let us know. We're going to be happy to help you. So first and foremost, let's talk about two specific types of gaps that we focus on the most. And by focus on the most, I mean these are really the boil-down version of every single gap out there. It is called the retest gap. And there's something called the gap and go. And really what these gaps do is they simply signify people who are losing money or who are making money. And those are the trends that you want to follow. And when you day trade, these, these retest gaps, and these gap and goes are what you want to focus on. You do want to focus on the gaps because gaps give you the best edge, right? Anytime you're going to do any type of investment or any type of forward thinking with your money, whatever it might be, business or real estate, whatever you're doing, you want to go with the most edge, with the most probabilities, where everything is stacking in your favor. That's what you want to trade. And you want to do your best possible impression of not taking a trade that you don't want to take all the time. That's what you want to do. You want to do the best you can of not taking a trade just because you say, well, I think it might work out. If you ever are in that mindset, if you're ever in that frame of mind where you say to yourself, you know what, I think this trade could work. This trade might work. Eh, I'm kind of bored, so I'm going to place it. Well, that actually is the exact opposite of what you want to do. <laughs> if, you can, if you know for a fact in your head, when you guys can recognize that type of mentality. If you can recognize the, well, I might as well. If you can recognize that you're doing that, don't take that trade. That's not going to be a trade that you should take. You should move on. You want a trade where you can say, yes, 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 yes. I like all those aspects to it. I'm going to take this trade. I have no problem risking my risk unit to take this particular trade. So let's give an example. Uh, this is KERX, Carex Biopharmaceuticals. And let's discuss the gap today and why I haven't traded it yet and I will not be trading it, um, at least to my knowledge. So first and foremost, today's gap opened at 1037. The low of yesterday's candle was 1033. 
So yesterday being Friday was 10.33. The open of today, actually, I'm sorry, was 10.38. So it's a white candle and it gaps down. Let's talk about the why. Let's talk about why people are afraid and why this lower wick right here was created. Okay? It was created because yesterday was a nice, long hammer candle. A hammer candle at support. So here's your support line right there. You got a nice hammer candle that comes in. So the hammer candle obviously represents buying pressure. So some people started buying yesterday. And you can look at that. You can look at the candle, right? It has a, it's a white candle with a long lower shadow. Lower shadows, lower wicks, they always represent buying power, buying pressure, always. So here you go. Here's a prime example. The longer the lower shadow is, the more buying pressure there is. So obviously, Friday and today on KERX, we're getting a lot of buying pressure. So when the stock gapped down, who was the most affected on today's gap? Who were the people that were most affected? That is the people from yesterday, or in this case, Friday. The most previous trading day. So when you're day trading or when you're trying to create any type of trade, it doesn't matter if it's a weekly credit spread, it doesn't matter if it's a swing trade, it doesn't really matter what it is. The most recently affected people are going to care the most about the trade. So aka the prior day's candle. The prior candle really is the most important in a trade because if you can figure out the prior candle what people are thinking you can have a little bit better of an interpretation of what the future may hold on this particular trade so to keep it really really simple what we did is we boiled down the two types of gaps because there's so many gaps out there and there's a lot of schools of thought a lot of trains of thought uh trains of thought is that a term there's a lot of schools of thought and, and uh disciplines about different types of gaps there's tons of different names it really doesn't matter what you call it. What you got to ask yourself is who is the most affected in the trade and why are they affected? What's happening? So yesterday, you have a giant buying candle, very, very strong buying candle. This morning, we had a small gap down. Who was affected? Well, the people who bought yesterday, a.k.a. Friday, were they losing money at the open of the market, yes or no? Sunny Trader, what do you think? Were they losing money? Mm-hmm. They were. So they had their stops in place, right? So if they, had, they bought in Friday, they probably had their stop below the low of today's candle. So when the stock gapped down, they were worried. Then when the stock went lower, they began to sell in a panic because they were afraid of losing money on the trade. They were worried. They were concerned. So keeping that in mind, knowing that, okay, this is a strong candle on Friday. We're gapping down. So anytime, and I'll go ahead and type this in the chat pane for you guys so you can have it for your records. Um, anytime a white candle gaps down, this is a gap and go. It's just a gap and go. That's the type of gap. I mean, you could call this any kind, any type of gap you want to. It doesn't matter, right? The names are just a, something. It's just an e, an easy nomenclature that you can use to say, okay, what what type of gap is this and why? Well, it's a gap and go. So if it's a gap and go, that means that you know for sure that there are someone out there trapped. Somebody out there is losing money, and they're scared. They're worried, and they're going to start selling at some point. That's the truth about gap and goes. And this is actually, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but on a gap and go, there will always be selling at some point during the day. At some point. It could be in the very, very early morning. It could be in the afternoon. It could be in the middle of the day. But there's going to be some point on a gap and go where there is some selling. Even if it lasts five minutes and the, all the rest of the day is buying, there's always going to be a place and time where it sells. And that's just how the market works. Any day, any time of any day on any stock, there's going to be buying and there's going to be selling. So K-E-R-X, white candle gaps down. Gap and go. However, 
There was one really important piece of the puzzle on KERX why I personally did not love the gap. Who can tell me what it was? Who can tell me? Zane. Bingo. Marsha, what do you think? Sam Rose, you got anything for me? Anybody else? What was one of the reasons I didn't... Pr- I looked at the trade, I was like, eh, you know, didn't like it. Well, the reason is... As I wrote down earlier, the low of yesterday was 10.33. The open of today was 10.38. So at the open, yes, people were losing money, but not everybody. Not everyone. What about the people who bought at the very, very low of the day yesterday? Were they losing money at the open? No. Okay. So that makes it automatically a much less appealing gap, in my personal opinion. The open is very, very important. The open of the market is incredibly important on any given stock because it gapped down to the low. Now, yes, you guys can see that it did move bearish at some point. We're going to go look at that in just a few moments. But once it did not open below the low of this candle, I really stopped watching it, at least in the beginning of the morning. I stopped looking at it, just moved on. Because that's the important thing about day trading. And that's the beautiful thing about day trading. You have all day to trade. The the market is open for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. So don't worry about the first few minutes. If you miss a trade in the first few minutes or the first few seconds, that's okay. There's plenty of time in the afternoon to trade. The next candle is coming. So just don't worry about it. So if you do not love the very, very beginning of the market or the open of the gaps or whatever it is, then don't worry about it. Understand that there will always be another opportunity just right in front of you, right around the corner. So KERX would have been much more bearish if it opened below the low of yesterday because everyone at that point would be losing money. Everyone. Everyone who bought on Friday would be losing money. So it made it a much more interesting of a bearish gap. So that's a gap and go. Now let's just go look at this on a five minute time frame just so we can see what's going on. And on a five minute time frame, you can see that it opened and the first five minutes sold off because there were some people being trapped. Who, who then were the buyers? Well, the buyers were a few people. The buyers were the people that yesterday did not buy and said to themselves, well, I didn't buy yesterday and it went up, so I'm going to buy today because it didn't gap that far. So they started buying. Also, the people who started buying were the people who were covering their short positions. The bearish traders, because they realized that you know it didn't make it too low, so they started buying, taking in some profits and moving it from there. So KERX, trade down in the morning, and then as of right now, the interesting thing about it is you have a very, very relative high. So the high is about 10.86 is above the high of the day. So here's a resistance, here's a resistance, here's a resistance, here's a resistance. So is the edge bearish? And the answer, not really. Not really, because right now you have a giant white candle with a lot of bullish volume. So you have a giant white candle with a lot of bullish volume. When I say giant white candle, I do mean on the daily chart. So if you go and look at KX, KRX again on the daily chart, you'll see a giant white candle. Here it is. Big white candle. So this candle already says to me, you know what? There's a lot of buying pressure. This is a pretty bullish candle. Look at the volume. Look at the wick. Look at the size of the candle. This is pretty bullish. So based on the candle right now, based on the open of the candle, those are two reasons why I don't personally love this trade, love the gap, as a day trade. Those are two reasons. If I come in here to the five-minute chart, I can begin to find reasons why I do like to trade. So I'm looking at the five-minute chart. I'm saying, okay, well, here's a high, here's a high, here's a high. This looks to be like a little bit of a double top. And if we break this low, right, this is your risk. 
and then your potential reward is all the way down here. So one thing I do like about the trade is the risk to reward. I agree with you. I like it. This is the five minute chart. Let's go look at the 15 minute chart. Here's a 15 minute chart. 15 minute chart also looks pretty decent. Here are the exponential moving averages, however. In the exponential moving averages, you'll see that we're actually above them right now. Hmm. Interesting. That was actually the very the second thing that I found when I looked into this trade entry day. Is I was like, well, we're above the moving averages on the 15 minute time frame. So the stock really could just trade right to the moving averages and bounce, which I don't know if that's what it's going to do, but it's, it really could do that. So to have the best edge, ladies and gentlemen, for your day trades is make sure the stock is either above or below the moving averages, whatever time frame it is that you're trading on all time frames. So I'll say that again, the best edge for day trades comes in when all time frames, so I'm going to type that in. So that's the uh, daily, hourly, 15 minute, and five minute. When all time frames, the moving averages are either below the price for a bullish trade or below the price, or I'm sorry, or above the price for a bearish trade. For a bearish trade. There you guys go. So again, what, I, what that means is, if you are and you have all of your moving averages in all of the same direction on all time frames, that is the most high probability trades you can place. So let's just go look for one really, really quickly. And uh, let's just ask some questions. I'm going to go type in, someone's asking about LUV. So let's go look at LUV for just a moment. And again, this is just going to be for a purely swing trade expo explanation. So on the daily chart, we have here on the daily chart, we got the moving averages. They're going kind of down, but a little sideways. First and foremost, did Southwest have a gap today? Of anything that was interesting. Did it really have a gap? No. No real gap today. No one's scared. No one's losing money. No one's worried. Nothing's really happening. It's super exciting. So Southwest automatically would not have any day trade for me. Again, from just a purely from a day trade perspective, I wouldn't look at it. What about FLS? Did FLS gap today? No, not really. Nothing really interesting. Nothing really exciting. Right? So let's go look at SYT. You see me guys typing in SYT. SYT, did it gap today, ladies and gentlemen? Yes or no? Yes, it did. It did indeed gap. All right, so... When you're, when you're looking for a day trade, thumbs up for the gap. <laughs> Actually, this I'm sorry, this gapped down. So this did gap today. If you guys can tell me one other reason that I do not like this trade, at least initially, just for me personally, what would your guess be? Do you guys have any guess? What's one of the main reasons that I'm not just absolutely in love with this trade? Well, it gaps a lot. It gaps a lot. That's really all. I mean, because it's traded 24 hours a day on different exchanges, it gaps a lot. That doesn't mean that it can or cannot work, but you guys can see that SYT just simply gaps a lot. So I would really need this to meet all of my criteria before I really, really love this trade. So let's go into the five minute on SYT. And on the five minute, we're below the moving averages. On the 15 minute moving average, uh, I'm sorry, the 15 minute time frame, we're below all the moving averages. On the hourly chart, we are probably right in the middle of the moving averages. Yep, we're right in the middle of the moving averages. 
And on the daily chart, we are above the moving averages. So we got two time frames that are below, two time frames that were above. The stock gaps all the time. Probably not going to be the best trade to take, especially if you're a beginner. Let me put it to you that way, if you're a beginner. If you're trying to day trade, you're trying to learn how to day trade, you're trying to become really, really profitable at day trading, you've got to be able to build a system that works for you all the time so that you can become disciplined on that system. And what I mean by using a system is just really just a set of rules that you follow every single time, whatever that rule is. So you start getting better and better and better at that system, you can become better, better and better at your entries. So you gotta find the gap for day trading. You've gotta find a really good gap. You've gotta find some type of good opportunity to do something, uh, something that's moving that you can use to your advantage. Let's look at Tesla really quick. So Tesla, um, are we above or below the moving averages? Well, we're above them. Okay, so the moving on the daily chart. So we're above them on the daily chart. Okay, cool. On the hourly chart, are we above them or below them? Well, we're kind of above them on the hourly. All right, looks good. What about the 15-minute time frame? 15-minute time frame, yeah, we're above them on the 15-minute time frame. Okay, looks pretty decent. And what about the five-minute chart? The five-minute chart, we're above most of them. There's only two that we're not above right now, the 10 and the 20. So on all time frames on Tesla, we have... On the 10, I'm sorry, on the five minute, the 15 minute, the hourly and the daily, we're above all the moving averages, the 10, the 20, and the 50 exponential moving average. And did we gap today, ladies and gentlemen, on Tesla? The answer is yes, we did. It's a small gap. It is tiny. It's not the biggest gap in the world, but it did gap. And we are above all the moving averages on all time frames. So what does that mean for us? Well, that simply means that Tesla is one that you could have your eyes on because that now, now if you're creating a system for yourself, if you're trying to understand what to day trade, what not to day trade, why do I take the, some trades other, uh, over other trades? Now you have a little bit of an idea because the trades, especially on day trading, the best trades to take are the ones that the probabilities are the highest that you make some money. So as a real life example, what would I do on Tesla? I would come here on the on the five minute on the five minute chart. I'd look at it for a moment. I'd say to myself, okay, there's a little bit of a support right here. Boom, boom, boom. Obviously a little bit of a resistance. We're building some type of pattern right there. This could break in either direction. Would I take this trade bearish? Mm. No. I wouldn't. Why? Well, because we're, we're above a lot of the moving averages on a lot of the time frames. So it's not really a strong edge trade. What about the 15-minute chart? Well, the 15-minute chart's interesting. 15-minute chart, we have a little bit of a potential morning star reversal pattern. Black candle, white candle, white candle. So I would be interested in a move above um, 230.75. But what entry do you guys like better for Tesla? Do you like the $230.70 or do you like $231.34? Which one do you like more and why? I'm happy to pause here for a little moment, but let's just look at it. So on Tesla, if I was giving you guys an actual entry, one to put your hard-earned money on to make some funds, to make your cash grow, which one do you like and why? Yeah. What about you, Angie? Are you about to answer? I was, okay. actually. What's up, Angie? Go but I'm going to let everybody else talk first. Oh, okay, cool. That works. Which ones do you guys like and why? All right, so this is interesting. So I got some different answers. I got the lower one. I got 230.70. I got 230.31. And there's pros and cons to both. That's the beautiful thing. There's the pros and there's cons to both of these entries. So I can make an argument for either one, but I know which one I would take personally. All right, Angie, what's your answer? What you got for me? Oh, I just typed it. Angie says, I like the lower one best. Okay. Because if you wait for the upper one, then there's not very much room to go before the next resistance. There we go. I like it. So Angie's saying, I like this one right here because the risk to reward is better. Guys, is that a correct answer? Yes or no? 
Yeah, that's a correct answer. Right, I told you I can make an argument for both. So here's the argument for the second one. The argument for the second one is, well, the reason I chose the second one is because this is a really, really big black candle on the 15-minute chart. And I know that big black candles are a resistance. So if we're going to make this a higher move, then I need to get above the black candle. Because there's a lot of resistance, and you guys can see that there's some support resistance right about here, like I pointed out earlier. So we need to get above this candle. Okay, so I have two answers. Which one's right? Well, the answer is both of them are correct. Now it becomes, do you pull the trigger on one or the other? Well, if you chose this bottom entry based on this entry and this stop, can you decide to not place that trade, yes or no? The answer is yes. You can decide to not place the trade. Would I personally do that? Well, yeah, I am. If this, was, if this was a great trade, I'd tell you guys to take it. I mean, if, I, if I'm going through today and I say, oh my gosh, this is a sensational trade. God, that's what we do, guys, in the room. We place trades. right? We try to, we, we do make money. We, that's our goal. We want to trade. So we want to find something that looks nice. But the 23070 entry offers great risk to reward ratio, but it's a little tight based on this candle. The 23134 is the better entry, offers a much worse risk to reward ratio, so therefore, this particular trade, I can see the entries, but also based on the gap, which is kind of a eh, it's not the it's not the most phenomenal gap in the world. What will I do? I'll just move on. So we found a potential trade. We found one that we liked, but you've got to go through all aspects on every stock when you're getting into the trade. Find reasons why you don't like it. And if you can find a reason why you personally don't like the trade, then just don't, simply don't take it. If you can't find a reason that you personally do not like the trade, if you're like, I like everything about this trade, then take it. It's really about it. And once you can understand why you like certain trades and you start understanding, okay, I like certain trades for this reason. I like certain patterns for this reason. I like doing this. I like doing that. Then you start building the system and you just do the same thing over and over and over. So on Tesla Motors, if Tesla did break out above here, break out above this price, come up to this resistance right here, retest, do something like this, and then break out, what do you guys think? Could we come back in an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and take it bullish from here and place the stop right about there? Could that be another opportunity in the future? Absolutely. So a small nugget to take away is if you can't find a reason that you like to trade, then don't trade it. Create a plan for what you want it to do in the future for you to like the trade. And if it does it, then you get into the trade. That's simple, guys. That's the magic. You can never control the market. The only things that we can control are ourselves, our entries, our stops, how much risk we put on the trade, how much capital we put on the trade. That's what we can control. Do we follow our plan? Do we not follow our plan? Are we too aggressive? Are we too impulsive? Are we not disciplined enough? That's the only things that we can control. So let's go look for a few more, shall we? Let's go look for a retest gap. Anyone got a good retest gap for me? I'm trying to think of some. Um, let me go see if Red Hat did anything today. Nope, Red Hat didn't do much today. Micron, not much there. Apple had a little bit of a retest gap. Very small though. Patricia says, O-N. All right, thank you, Patricia. O-N. So here's a retest gap. Retest gap, very simple. A retest gap is when a white candle gaps up the next day or a black candle gaps down the next day. Guys, that's it. That's all you need to know. Look at the prior day. White candle, black candle. It's a white candle. Okay, what did it do? Gapped up? Okay, it's a retest gap. That's it. That's the key. White candle gaps up, retest. What does that mean when I say retest? All right, well, let's explain the why behind why does it retest. The reason it retests is because someone who bought, let's call that guy Dennis, Dennis bought on Friday. He bought some shares Stock gaps up unexpectedly. So what does he do? Oh, wow. I got a profit really quickly. 
I need to sell. And that's it. That's the case. <laughs> that's the case. That's all it is. That's the why. Because there are real life traders out there who buy previous day, stock randomly gaps up. They don't know why. So they sell to lock in their profits. So when do they sell? At some point. You know, if they're at work, maybe they sell their maybe they sell on their cell phones, sell on their cell phones. <laughs> Maybe they're logging into work. Maybe they call their friend and have them log into their account and they sell or whatever. It doesn't matter, but they sell. They, they always sell at some point. Always. So here's the five minute. And here, guys, here, you guys, here you guys go. Here's the stock that opens. When the stock opens, boom, it runs. And then this is all the people selling to lock in a profit. That's what they do. So on a retest gap, what you must do, should do, have to do, or begin to do is wait for the retest. Type in a one if you still ask yourself, what does the retest look like, Jeremy? What does it look like? What am I waiting for? What does the retest look like exactly? You guys ready for the key? The key of the retest is very simple. Create what you want to see. Create what you want. Because there is no definite answer. The, de the closest thing I can get to a definite answer is get a reversal candle pattern off of a moving average. That's the best that I got. What moving averages do we use to day trade with? And again, you guys can use any day trades, any, any moving averages you want. I personally use the 10, 20, 50 exponential moving average. Why? Because they work. Can you use others? Yeah. Are there others out there? Yeah. You could use the 8 exponential, 8 simple, 13, 13.8, 20 simple, 20 exponential, 20 weighted, 20 on balance. Guys, you can use any moving average you want. There's so many out there, it, it really doesn't matter. Right? If you use... If you go to nine different day trading schools, all nine will probably have a different moving average that they use. And if you use all nine of them, you're not going to be nearly as good as any of the guys who are teaching you for the ones that they use. All of them use something different, usually. Sometimes they'll use the 20 exponential or the 20 simple, but then they'll have different, you know, on balance volumes and they'll, they'll use different things. Right. So overall, in my personal opinion, I simply say just pick whichever whichever one you like the most. Just pick one and just stick with it because they do all work. So then create what it is that you want to see. So on ON semiconductor, and again, this is hindsight. This is the best I can do, but I'm going to try my best with hindsight. Is this a reversal candle? Yes or no. Off of a moving average? Yes or no. The answer is yes to both. It is a reversal candle off of a moving average. Is it a good reversal candle? <laughs> what do you guys think about that answer? Is it a good reversal candle? No. Why? No, it's black. It's a black candle. It's a black candle. What does that mean? That means that there are still some sellers out there somewhere. So anytime you get a black candle, there is and always will be more selling pressure than buying pressure if you have a black candle. Simple as that. Always. Always and forever. If it's a black candle, there is more selling pressure than buying pressure. Always, 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 always. So if you get a black candle, you need a little bit more confirmation. So to me, I would say, all right, well, I at least want to close above this price minimum. Minimum, I would want to close. Then, based on this little short-term resistance right here, I'd probably want to move higher because it's not a strong candle. Well, obviously, once you got this, this this candle, which is by no means a bullish candle, right? It's an upper shadow. It's not bear, not bullish at all. You then wait. You wait and you wait and you wait and you get this candle, right? Nice white candle. 
has a big upper shadow, but now it's a white candle. Well, what do you do? Well, then you say, okay, well, maybe I want to move above this wick right here and I'll put the stop at the low of the day. Well, you don't get that. So the stock comes down, comes down into the moving average. Boom, 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 boom. And then, ladies and gentlemen, you get this candle right there. Is that a reversal candle off of a moving average? Yes or no? Yes or no? What do you guys think? And feel free, ladies and gentlemen, everyone to write this one in. Let's get some group participation. If you're here, might as well go for it. Is it a reversal candle off of moving average? Yes, it is. Nice little hammer candle. Beautiful. So what do you do? Oh my goodness. I, this is the candle that I want, you say to yourself. <laughs> All right. But what do you do now? What do you, what do? You, do? <sighs> you take a deep breath because you realize that you are now below the 10 exponential on the five minute time frame. So you say to yourself, all right, well, I got to get above the 10 exponential moving average. And if I get above this wick right here, I will have achieved that purpose. Correct? Would you guys agree? If you get above the wick of that candle, would you in fact be above the wick and above all moving averages on all time frames? Yes or no? And the answer is yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So what do you do? Okay, well, you base your entry and your stop, your risk reward, based on this guy right here. Entry, 1255, stop, 1242. This is called your stop value. 1255 by 1242. From there, you just go ahead and do a few calculations. That is... Uh, 13 cents of risk. And you guys know the deal from here. At least most of you do. You take your R, whatever. This is your, how much money you're going to lose per trade. Every trade, every single trade, one R, one risk unit. And you divide it by 13 cents. So let's say your R is 100. You divide 100 by 13 cents and you come up with how many shares you are going to buy in this scenario. That way you can control your risk so you know how much you're going to make or lose on any given trade. By the way, it's 769 shares. Okay, perfect. 769 shares. So from here, could you theoretically set your trade and walk away for the rest of the day? Could you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure could. You could create a, what I refer to as a stop, well, not what I refer to, it's just called a stop limit order. This is a buy, a buy stop limit for 1255, 769 shares, and you walk away. That's it. You're going to do a buy stop limit order and set it up, and then you can close your computer down or close the application down or go answer some emails or whatever it is that you have to do, you know, go do your thing. That's one choice. Choice number two, choice number two is you could continue to watch it for a little bit to see if it triggers. And once this triggers, ladies and gentlemen, could you have had a tighter stop? Yes or no? What do you guys think? Could you have a tighter stop once that triggers? Mm-hmm. I think so. Why? Perfect reversal candle right there. So you could have you could take your stop and move it up to 1243. So you've just taken a penny, or you can make it 1244. Either one will be okay. 12 1244, 1243, either one, thumbs up. I would approve of both. So if you need to recalculate, you could recalculate, right? That's 11 cents of risk or 12 cents of risk. So you're adding a few more shares. Get triggered into the trade. So you have your trade. Once you're triggered in, then you most certainly can walk away, right? You can place your stop, place your target, and you're done. Your target's two times your risk. That's 22 cents. 
That's 77. Here you go. Right there is 1 to 2R. $12.77. That's a 2R risk reward ratio. Based purely on the retest. Guys, you can find retest gaps, gap and goes, doesn't matter. It really doesn't. All you have to understand is is the gap strong? Is it trapping people? Are people making or losing money? And then play it. If it bounces off of moving average, play it. You'll never know if you're right or wrong. You'll never have any idea. Unless you can foretell the future, which I can't yet. And I'm, I'm really upset about it. I'm trying my best. But as of now, I can't foretell the future. So on ON, semiconductor, at this present point in time, what I would personally do is switch to the 15-minute time frame to, work, to see where my moving averages are on the 15-minute time frame. I see my moving averages. I would take my stop. I would go ahead and move it a little bit above break even. Let's just say 1256. And then I would absolutely just walk away. Again, if, if I'm trying to, if I'm working or, you know, I'm doing whatever, you know, if I'm part of a trading floor and you, we can, like you guys are, and you, we can watch it more and more throughout the day. Great. No worries there at all. But if you're trying to work, you're trying to get something accomplished or whatever the case is, you can set it, forget about it. And if you get stopped out now, you don't lose any money at all. And if you hit your target, you make two R. That sounds like a good deal to me. That sounds like a good deal. <laughs> Chris Wenzel. This is exactly where mine is currently. Nice work. Beautiful, man. <laughs> that does make me happy to hear. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah, so how long would we leave the stop in here? I don't know until you come back and look at it later. Right? It's only it's only 142 Eastern. I don't know, maybe 242 Eastern or 342 Eastern. Just come back and look at what it's doing. Is it right here? Okay, cool. Exit, take your R off the table and go find the next one on Tuesday. That's really your goal. I mean, just mitigate your risk. Do the best that you can to mitigate risk. Find good gaps and go from there. Let's talk a few more moments about what is a very good gap. Let's talk about that. There are two right now that I see on ON semiconductors. One of the best gaps that you can get, ladies and gentlemen, one of the best gaps that you can get really is, is right here. It's, I'm almost working too perfectly, but this is, this is it. The best gaps that you can receive is that you simply say to yourself, is the gap clearing a strong pivot? What do you guys think, yes or no? Is it clearing a strong pivot? Yep, it is indeed. Here is the one other very unique aspect that a lot of companies for some reason is kind of gloss over. Is it barely clearing a strong pivot? Ah. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is your keys to the kingdom. Is it barely clearing a strong pivot? Why do I say barely? Let's think about, I'm trying to find one that doesn't work on ONN. I guess I don't have that long of a time frame to do it. Let me, um, let me come over to Twitter. Twitter. Okay. Twitter and let's look at, um, I'm going to go look at this gap right here. So it was a while ago. Let's just look at it for a moment. So this gap uh, on Twitter from here to here, first and foremost, that was a retest gap. Okay, it was a retest gap, pretty strong gap. Did it retest? Yep, it retested on both the day trade and the swing trade level. Works great for both. But notice that it didn't really, it didn't barely clear a pivot. Barely clearing a pivot would have been right here, 
right? Opening bearish right there or opening bearish right here. Just, you know, a pivot right below your support resistance lines, right below the wicks, whatever it is, you know, wherever it is on your chart, right below the short-term support and resistance. Those are really the best places to gap. And here is the why behind that. It's because the traders who are wrong, they see how much room they have to flip their position. So let's go look back over at ON, just for example, because this is a really a perfect example. So, ladies and gentlemen, was this candle created from short selling, yes or no? The answer is yep, it does indeed. How do we know that? Because it's a black candle. That's how we know. It's a black candle, so we know it was created from short sellers, 100% guarantee. We can bank on it. So what happens from there, ladies and gentlemen? Well, where would a short trader place their stop, in your opinion, if you had to guess? If you were a short trader who made money here last time and the time before, and you're trying to do it again, where would you place your stop? Well, probably right above here, right about there. About 10.64. Okay, so what does that mean to me as a day trader? Well, if you're gapping to a location where another trader is immediately wrong, but just barely, they go in with an understanding that, okay, I'm going to lose on this trade, but I'm just going to flip my position because I'm losing the amount of money that I thought I was going to lose or that I'm expected to lose. So now I'm just going to flip because there's a lot of room on the upside. As opposed to if the stock gapped to right here, is that still a good gap, ladies and gentlemen? Yes or no? For the day trade. I'm talking about day trading only right now. Is that still a good gap for the day trade? If it opened it blue? Well, yeah. It's still a good gap. Because number one, you're clearing a pivot. And number two, you got the black candle so you know some people are getting trapped. But what are the short sellers doing? They're more or less hoping and praying that the stock goes down a little bit before they begin to buy to close. That's what they're hoping for. They're hoping that, okay, I'm, I'm really, really hoping that someone out there bought, so they're going to begin to sell, expecting a bounce at some point. That's when they begin to buy so the gaps that barely clear pivots, just barely, are the ones that you really, really want to keep your eyes on for the majority of the day. And you'll know within a few minutes, as in like two or three minutes, if they're going to work or not for that day. You'll know within just a few minutes of time. And what you can do in this situation is you can look for and you can try to find um, some pre-market lows if you have pre-market data. So the stock is gapping up. You can try to find some pre-market data. See if you can put a stop below and enter on the one or two minute high and just take the trade bullish based on that based on that particular trade. So let me give you an idea. This is what I did on Microsoft not too long ago. Now Microsoft uh, was a pretty far gap Right, so I did wait just a little bit, but you guys can see that it cleared a very, very strong resistance. I mean, that was a beautiful pivot. It cleared this resistance, cleared this resistance right here. You guys see that? So it was a retest gap. So when it gapped up here, I waited for a small rotation down, and then I found a pre-market low, which I believe was like 44.96 or something. And I took it about 45, I think it was 45.96 by 44.96. I think it was the something to that extent. I could go and find it again if I needed to. But this gap, I would have played it much more aggressively had Microsoft opened, I don't know, right about here. 
right about there, just right above that pivot. I would have been a little bit more aggressive with that entry, but I did still wait just a little bit. Same thing with Amazon and Netflix recently. The larger the gap up, even if it's a phenomenal gap, doesn't matter. I love great gaps. You guys know I'll play them all the time. But even on a nice gap like that on Amazon, I'm still going to wait a little bit because that's the exact same thing the short sellers are doing. They're waiting for just a little bit for that rotation down and then for the pop. So if we come over here to Amazon, let me try to find that day. Here it was. Here's the day. So this is a five-minute time frame, okay? So on your five-minute, ladies and gentlemen, you can see here's all the short traders being trapped. This is them hoping and praying that it goes lower. This is them hoping and praying that it goes lower. And it comes back to that exact same level where it bounced, so they begin to buy. There's your entry on Amazon. Right there. And it took you um, 10 o'clock. So that's an hour and a half after market open before you get a really good entry. An hour and a half. Type in a one and feel free to type, but type in a one if you know, if you really truly do understand the distinction between a large gap and a gap that doesn't gap very far. So a gap that gaps really far and a gap that doesn't gap very far at all. Do you guys understand the difference between the two? Sometimes it's a percentage thing, but sometimes it's just not depending on the type of stock. It's a visual thing, right? When I say too far, you guys can see this was a, on a daily chart, this was a really, really big gap. And let's just go back here. All right, this is a massive, look at look how big this thing is. It gapped way up here. Huge gap. So the bigger the gap, the longer you want to wait for some action. When I say the bigger the gap, I mean talking numerical, percentage, location, all of that. The longer you want to wait. Microsoft, same thing. I got into Microsoft a little bit earlier than I should have in hindsight, even though I just absolutely destroyed the trade. I could have done a little bit better because I did take it about 20 minutes earlier than I could have. I, if I waited just a little bit longer, because I knew it was a great gap, so I just didn't want to wait too long because I knew it was going to run. But it really did for the first, I don't know, 45 minutes, a slow start taking off. Um, let me go back over here to Amazon and, uh, let's talk about this gap right here. So this gap, ladies and gentlemen, what do you guys think? Type it a one. If this is a, if this is a big gap or two, if it's barely clearing a pivot, which one do you guys think? One, if it's a large gap or two, if it's barely clearing a pivot. All right, so I'm getting a lot of twos. Let's look at it. There are, ironically enough, uh, one or two great barely clearing of pivots. Here's one. So if it had if it had gapped up to like right about there, that would have been barely clearing a pivot. That would have been great. Right here is the other gap, other pivot that it barely cleared. But... The reason I ranked this as a one for me personally is because of this guy right here. It did not barely open above that pivot. So I said to myself, okay, this is a great, I mean, I was all over the gap. I loved it for sure. I was thumbs up, ready to play it all day. If you guys were here with me that day, this was in February. Do you guys remember how long it took before I pulled the trigger on that trade? We did a bull put spread as well as a trade setup on Amazon, same day. Do you guys remember how long it took? About 55 minutes, give or take. For this little guy right here, this lower wick, that's what we waited for to happen. We waited for the lower wick. Also, because you had a prior white candle. So I took those two things into conjunction. I said, man, it really is kind of barely clearing this pivot right here. I love that. Um, it really took out this pivot very, very strongly, barely cleared that one, but not really clearing that one at all. 
And we have a retest gap. I'm going to wait about 30 to 45 minutes for that trade to go through, and then I'm going to pull the trigger. And that's what I did. That was that was exactly, I mean, exactly how I played that. Now, let's just scroll back here for just a moment, and let's look at this on Amazon. Ladies and gentlemen, did this gap right here barely clear a pivot, yes or no? What do you guys think? Did it barely clear a pivot? And the answer is yes, indeed. What was the pivot that it barely cleared? This one right there. Guys, that's barely. I mean, we're talking... If you go on your screen and you can draw that size. I know that's a, a horrible, <laughs> horrible way for my for my people who need details i'm so sorry i'm really trying to figure out a numerical thing for you guys but really it's depends on the stock it can be a few points or a few cents it really depends on the stock but we're talking just barely if you can draw about a centimeter on your screen a centimeter and a half that's barely clearing a pivot here's another beautiful thing you guys ready let's make sure we talk about this because again Ladies and gentlemen, did this gap right here barely clear a pivot? Yes or no? The answer is yes. <laughs> did I lose on that trade? What do you guys think? I did. Yeah. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, I lost. Okay, how much did I lose? I lost one R. It barely cleared the pivot. I took the trade, lost the R. How much did I make on this trade over here? That was in February 2014. Phenomenal gap. Made about 4.3 R. You guys get the difference? Doesn't matter how much you win, what matters is how much you lose. Lose as little as possible, and the winners will take care of themselves. Mitigate your risk as much as possible. Here is another one. Um, and again, by all means, I did not take this trade. But I'm going to make sure I post it for those of you who want to see in hindsight. I will write out a trading plan of exactly where I want it to gap. This was, I wrote this the day before. So I wrote this on uh, April 30th, this exact trading plan. If Cooper Tire CTB gaps down and opens below 4030, so 4030 was, I want to take out the low of this candle right there. I want to take out that low, but I wanted to open above this gap. So this was the range that I wanted it to clear. I don't remember. Oh, I do remember. I was just, I took a day off from trading from that day because I was very happy about April. So I just didn't, I didn't want to get cocky and blow it out the water. Um, Chris says, why above the gap? Because I wanted, I wanted something for it to trade to. Because the gap's below that gap, um, then it was starting to gap a little too far. Right, because if it got below the gap, then you have this little guy right here, this little pivot. It's a very, very small pivot, but then you have that pivot that could be an issue, and now you're getting, you know, it's a little bit of a far for just barely clearing. So that's the thing is I wanted it to gap above the gap and below this wick to really just barely clear the pivot. Does that make sense, Chris? Just so I know, if it gapped above the gap, that it would probably trade through the gap. I'm, I'm, I would assume that's that's all I was going for. My assumption would be that if it gapped above, it would at least trade to the gap. And if it traded to that gap, then I don't think anything was going to hold it back. So it's just going to continue. Um, I don't really trade Cooper Tire that much, but let's just check this out. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now that I'm here, this gap right here, this is the 2nd of May, 2014. Did that barely clear a pivot? It did. It barely cleared a pivot. Did not clear this one. 
So I might have played that as a day trade. Probably not. But I would have been looking at that for a swing trade for sure. Because again, guys, on day trades and swing trades, when you start to um, look at your gaps and your pivots, when you start clearing pivots, this was a retest, boom, retested, retested twice, in fact. You could have at least had the understanding, could have at least had the knowledge down this location to be more bullish than bearish based on the day trade and the swing trade. Does that make sense, boys and girls? Any questions on that so far? Or any questions so far about what we've kind of covered to, d to date? I will pause here for a minuto. If you have a question, feel free to let me know. Again, judgment-free zone. No question's a bad question. Sonny says, do I understand correctly that Owen is a good overnighter for you, Jeremy? Uh, that is a good question. So, Sonny, for me personally, if I'm taking a, a swing trade into a day trade, I need to know that before the gap happens. Before the gap happens. So, it's, I will say this. For me to place a swing trade on the same day that I place a day trade. Because usually, I do not go in with the, okay, what am I going to do on the swing trade before the gap happens? So if you want to hold something overnight, and again, this is just the way I trade personally, Sonny, is if the stock gaps up, and I don't, I don't think it's a perfect gap, then I don't do a swing trade. If it's a gap that I just absolutely fell in love with, and I saw it before the gap happens, which again is slightly rare, because usually, for me, if I go through most of my analysis, I go through a lot of my gap analysis at about 8.27 Eastern. I go very, very quickly. 8.27 Central, which is 9.27 Eastern. So while Brad is you know, doing his the morning room with you guys and instructing and helping and teaching, I'll in, and within three minutes, I'll go through as many gaps as possible and just look at them, no, 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 yes, no, 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 yes, no, no, no. And then by 8.30, I'll find three. And then those would be the ones I focus on. And by that time, the gap's probably already happened. The market's already open. Therefore, I don't place a swing trade. So in my personal advice, if I could give any advice is, if you want to place a swing trade based on the gap, do it before the gap happens or the day after. Because you'll always get another opportunity the next day. If that makes sense. Does that make sense, uh, Sonny? Does that help? So for ON, I'm not going to hold that overnight personally. I love the fact that it barely cleared this pivot. It makes it a good gap, right? Got a little bit of a double bottom type of pattern. But it's a retest gap anyway on the day trade. So therefore, if I was going to swing trade this, I would probably say to myself, all right, well, I'm going to wait for two or three days of a pullback and then I'll buy the bounce. So that, I guess that's what I would kind of have on ON. Does that help, big guy? He said, thanks. All right, beautiful. 